Hey customizers, welcome to another adventure at Talking Hands Customs to all my subscribers. Thank you very much. And for those of you joining us for the first time, oh, do I have a project for you. Okay, first off, we need to have a little celebration because for my longtime viewers, you may remember that the fire bat likes to break when I take it apart. But what I show you here before you to your eyes is one of two fire bats that I have disassembled without breaking them. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. You're too kind. You're too kind. Everybody in the back too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, shut up. So we've got a fire bat disassembled here. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing Toxic Cobra, right? Right? I love it because lots of people hate it. But anyway, um, but with a little bit of a twist in that we made some things for under the wings because the regular loadout just wasn't going to work. So I've got uh, another fire bat here that is together. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you what I did here. So um, I have some footage of me making these from scratch in a tutorial fashion. However, I don't think all the angles were great. Um, and once I started doing this, I realized we could do at least a whole episode, if not a whole series on what I'll call things under the wings, but you can do it for any vehicle. So what it boils down to is upping your scratch building game a little bit and using found objects to make things for your vehicle so you don't have to hunt them down. And if they don't exist as 3D prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about scratch building as a tool to fix or make or rescue a custom. And in this case, I employed it uh, very uh, thoroughly. So what I've done here is this whole project started off inspired by uh, messing around with some extra um, accessories. This is going to be a little messy here. But bear with me. From other aircraft to see what would fit on where. Because G.I. Joe has two kinds of pylons, okay? They have the uh, what I call the dog bone pylon, which is two circles connected with a slot. And then they have the tab pylon, which is just a tab, a rectangular tab, and the corresponding accessory has a slot in it, just like that. And there's the tab on the fire bat right there, once it focuses, okay. So you can see here, this tank I've made slots right onto the fire bat, and we're good to go. Anyway, taking a step back from that, not all of these pylons are the same size across all the vehicles. So while that makes sense, you know, some larger missiles are, and some smaller missiles would naturally have different size attachment points. Um, they're kind of all over the place. And I say kind of because there is some cross compatibility. Uh, and when I was mucking about with a fire bat, what I did is I took an X30 tank and I, even though it's a dog bone, I put it on the tab because the tab is smaller. And I love that oversized uh, ordnance look on the wings. And I zoomed it around my house as all professionals do to see how much I liked it and I was settled on it. Problem is, is that you can't fit two of them beside each other because of the fins. And yes, I could hack the fins off. Uh, and by all means, if you want to have four tanks on there and hack the fins off or whatever, then go for it. But what I wanted to do is take this opportunity to try and scratch build something, make it a little bit more purposeful uh, and save the tank for a later project. So uh, because we're trying, uh, what I try to do here is I try to keep the amount of tools introduced to a minimum because, I mean, if we all went out and bought lathes and drill presses and whatever, then yeah, we can make a whole bunch of stuff. But that's that's expensive. You might not have the space for it. So by working on our workbenches with things like sheet styrene and found objects and kit bashing parts from other vehicles, then we can really keep things uh, confined and as inexpensive as possible. So let's look at one of these tanks and I'll show you what I did real quick. So first thing I did was because I liked the length of the X30 tank, what I did is I cut a piece of a half inch tube, the same length as the tank, minus the nose cap and the tail cap. Then what I did is I've been saving up all of these little uh, caps. They're from syringes uh, for diabetes or whatever. My, one of my cats has diabetes. So anyways, I save up the syringe caps from there. I ask friends to save their caps too if they have any stuff like this. And I have a huge collection of these to be used for whatever I need them for, really. Um, so I glued that on one end. Then I took the other end and I shoved one inside the tube 
um, to give it some dimension. Then I took some rod, which will be common throughout this project, cut an angle into it, which is easier than you think, and I glued two on there. So those are the actual spray pipes where the, the chemical would come out because I'm pretending that this shoots like defoliating stuff or, or um, like stuff that eats plants or, um, you know, just some kind of environmental toxin, maybe even CFCs or something. If you've seen that episode, <laughs> it's hilarious. Where are the CFCs? <laughs> anyway, we'll be fine. Um, so that was it. I made four of those. And like I said, I have footage of me making those, but it's not the best. So you either, well, we'll see what we do with it. Either way, there's going to be a future episode or series on making a whole bunch of different styles because I got really inspired to show you guys that. Uh, and it'll actually open up your repertoire for some really cool stuff. And then what I've got up front here is uh, it, it's got triple inspiration. And what it is, is the Firebat stat card actually says it has one 7.62 millimeter minigun on it, not two lasers on it. I know why the toy has lasers and it. it looks cool, right? Um, and they're certainly available if there's 3D prints. But I said, you know what, why don't we have a little fun and let's bring this back to its original form. So what I've done is I've scratch built a removable uh, Gatling gun here. And all this is, is the same rod that I put down here, that same diameter of rod, is the central rod for this Gatling gun. Here, I'll get the focus to stay put is the central rod for this Gatling gun, which you can see down the middle. I made mine a five barrel uh, piece. So then I glued smaller rods equidistant around that main rod. Once that dried, or close to it, because I got excited, I then took this diameter of tube here and here, it's the same diameter. I cut a narrow piece for the end here, whatever that's called, the, let's call it just the end ring for now. And then the base ring or the base tube. And then I shoved that assembly right inside there. There was a little bit of extra space, but I just fudged it a bit. Uh, and the barrels actually only go, let's use a pointer here, only go about this far back in the uh, in the scratch build. And then I took a smaller diameter tube and I shoved it up in there for these barrels to sit on as well to help reinforce. I then found a good center line and I drilled some holes, connected those holes together with an X-Acto knife to form a rectangular hole. I then sandwiched together a bunch of super thin styrene. You almost might be able to make it out there if I get the light on it just right. There you go. You see all that? There's about five layers in there, which I measured the thickness on the fire bat up. Shoved that in there, glued it down so it all melded together. And then this back piece is two thick rectangular, you can see the line there, uh, thick rectangular uh, rod pieces. Pardon the focus. There we go. Thick rectangular rod pieces. I cut the angle on it with my miter box glued them together, sanded them, and then I imparted a slight curve on the top surface here. And then what I did is I shoved the Gatling gun, shoved, <laughs> I placed the Gatling gun, inserted the Gatling gun onto the fuselage after some fine tuning. There we go. And then what I did is I placed some glue on the block and I put it on and pressed it down so it was flush with the fuselage. So while the Gatling gun goes in vertically, this rear block here, this fake mounting point, if you will, is actually on an angle, as you can see here. And what that does is it lends it a little bit more realism. Uh, and this inspiration, uh, aside from the, the stats card saying that it had one Gatling gun, some of you might say, well, that doesn't look real at all. But what I'm gonna do is encourage you to go, uh, go look up the MiG-27 Flogger. It's an old Soviet attack aircraft and look at the Gatling gun on that, and you'll see where I got that idea from. The next thing I made was this pod here out of two end caps again, and the same diameter of tube I used for the main spray tanks with the same type of tab uh, installed, and that sits right on there on that side. And what this is, is this is the ammo drum for the Gatling gun. And if you look up the AV-8 Harrier uh, jump jet, it can carry, it doesn't always, but it can carry a belly pack that has two that's made up of two pods with a crossbar and the gun is in one pod the ammunition's in another pod and the crossbar is where the ammunition transfers over but in this case because it's got slots i pretend the ammo goes up there inside the fuselage and out into the gun a little fake but who cares and what it does is it uh well it really makes labor simple keeping in mind that as i work throughout this project i may change my mind and create that cross link between the two pieces but i have to make sure that it works that i can pull both things off together um, so that they don't get wedged in there so either way 
uh, you now have a accurate weapon system for the aircraft based off of the stats card. I think it's from Marvel or, or it's in the G.I. Joe comics or whatever. But uh, there you go. So now we've replaced all the ordnance, almost all the ordnance, on this fire bat for our theme, our given theme. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that for the story of this, this aircraft is so dangerous to G.I. Joe that it's a high priority target for them. So this actually includes some self-defense air-to-air missiles. These are from a modern series Sky Striker. They fit nicely on the pylon here, the dog bone pylon. They happen to work quite well. Um, the Sparrows work too. I didn't try the Phoenix missiles because they were too big. Uh, the bigger missiles, on, the biggest missiles on the Sky Striker because they might have come down here and screwed this up because I still want it to be able to sit on its tail like a regular fire bat. Um, so we're not going to have to scratch build anything there, but we could if we wanted to using the same techniques uh, over here. Uh, and that was it too. Like you can see the slot there, right? I found the center line, as you can tell by the marker line, and then uh, matched the slot point as it is on the dog bone of the X-30 tank. Made a rectangle out of drilling some holes, cutting it out and squaring it off and sizing it to fit on the tab. So now we have a fully loaded fire bat for our conversion. Now this one's going to go away for a future project. And I'll draw your attention back to the main fuselage. So I have some colors here that I'm messing around with. And this is probably the hardest color choices I've been trying to make in that with Toxic Cobra, I don't want to just go back and forth between mainly fluorescent green or yellow, well, fluorescent yellow, um, fluorescent orange, and just purple as an accent or as a main color. So what I want to do is introduce more colors. So what I did is I went into my G.I. Joe guide by Mark Belomo and I looked up the uh, toxic Cobra action figures, in this case the Sludge Viper uh, and Cesspool, and that introduces a few new colors, including this one. And unfortunately in this lighting it looks pure blue, but it's actually a green blue, almost like a sickly hospital color. And I'm going to use that in the design. I'm going to use the same purple I did for the Sludge Armor. If you haven't seen the Sludge Armor, it's a short on the channel, so wherever your other videos are on your screen there, go check that one out. Um, I'm going to tint the canopy, and right now I'm looking at clear green. The canopy's nice. It doesn't have really all that much damage on it, but um, minus one little bit. But I do want to tint it green because I've never done, I've never, I've tinted canopies before, but I haven't done green yet, and I think it'll fit in nicely with the Toxic Cobra environment and make it look really kind of, well, toxic. <laughs> um, and what we have to do, though, is that this tab here is missing the one little bit that keeps it kind of snug in the cockpit slot so we're going to probably add something to that and i'll either do it with clear styrene or regular white styrene painted black uh, i'll make that decision when i come to it and i'll show you what i do with that so in the meantime uh the main fuselage color while i'm thinking about that blue color that blue green color i'm also debating on a super dark blue but i think quite honestly that we'll be getting too close to the uh, dreadnought colors so I may try a little bit of a surprise I'm still thinking about it while I film this project so by the time you see this it'll be one smooth thing but uh, just so you know the thought process I'm going through because it actually looked good in a few configurations and on a, like with a lot of projects I wish I could do all of them but uh, in the meantime that's all there is to it and a few uh, color decisions for the accessories and in this case the accessories being not the weapons in this case but the uh, the landing gear and the uh, engine, the thruster here, the nacelle, whatever you want to call it. And the inside engine came apart nicely too under hot water. But uh, that's going to be all one color anyway. So it doesn't really matter, but it just came apart anyway, so you know. And uh, yeah, that's all there is to it. In fact, I actually forgot to remove this black piece here, which is also a bit of a pain. So I might actually re-soak this off camera and then I'll pop that black part out if I can. Um, because I've repaired fire bats before, if you're new to the channel, certainly go check it out. It was so much fun. It just kept breaking after I fixed it and breaking in a new place, etc., etc. And uh, I don't want to push my luck, but I do want to push my luck. So we'll see. We'll see. Either way, um, now that you've seen the ordinance, giving you a brief rundown on how all that works, um, let's get on with the main subject here and uh, get some paint applied.
Uh, the whole thing with this is while I was painting this, this took several days to do. Um, working with fluorescent colors is always going to be a more involved process because you need to have a smooth white base coat in order for the subsequently applied fluorescent colors to look good and they're gloss usually so they run a lot etc 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 however enter Vallejo game color fluorescent fluo line if you will um, it's new to me I don't know how long it's been around but I saw that they made um, fluorescent colors and I've used some of their brush stuff in the past which was okay but I think um, well, it's almost like a trial run for them, I guess. I don't really know. I don't dive into the industry of what companies do because honestly, I don't care. Um, but in this case, I was like, all right, I like Vallejo. Um, overall, they're probably my favorite paint company. I've shown you a few on this channel. Go with whatever you work, wh whichever works for you. But uh, overall, for brushing and airbrushing, Vallejo across the board for me works the best. So I saw this line of fluorescent colors and I ordered five or six of them, uh, some of which I used on this project. And I have to say that although it's an involved process to do fluorescent colors and you can use the words pain in the butt very freely with doing fluorescent colors, I would have to say that f the Vallejo colors were the least pain in the butty of working with fluorescent colors. So I was quite pleased with it. Um, I think I still haven't found the exact uh, recipe for their thinning and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I tried a few different things, plus I intermixed with some spray paint and everything just to get the project done. But uh, quite impressed with these, actually. So these will be my go-to for, um, I mean, look at this magenta, right? It's not pink, it's magenta. But um, call it what you will. Anyway, um, there was a lot of experimentation on there. And I used some spray paints as well that were similar to the orange spray paint I used for some of my Night Force projects. And it was okay. Um... I don't know if it was the weather conditions. This year is really humid out here. Normally we have very dry conditions, but um, there was a lot of factors going on there for what could make the paints work or not work. So regardless, here we are now. And I had this one, like this scheme on my phone. I had four or five of them on my phone, actually. I liked them all, but it turns out that through application, this one was my favorite. So uh, that's what I've stuck with. And the colors I've used, in case you want to replicate it, are Vallejo Game Color Night Blue. Vallejo Game Color Fluo, I don't know if that's it or not, but anyways, Fluorescent Green. And then Vallejo Game Color Fluorescent Magenta. And that's how I got this. Um, for Things Under the Wings, which is going to lead to something later. Um, this was the ammo uh, drum I was telling you about, and that was to show you that you could take the simple shapes, uh, exactly what we were using over here, and make something else with it. And... Um, that's certainly true. So now we've got our green spray tanks here to look super cool. Um, messing around with ideas and whatnot. There's the green sidewinders for self-protection. And then we've got our little pod system here. And I replaced the ammo drum. And this there was two reasons behind that. Um, I like this design. It's simple. It's to show you that using the exact same materials, you can make things with different lengths, blah, blah, blah. But I think you get the picture. And I think we've done enough of this ultra basic scratch building and even this basic scratch building to um, move it up to the next level. So here's the five barreled Gatling gun I made um, all greened up and right beside it is the new ammo pod. So in this case, um, oh darn, where's my example? There it is. Now the thing with scratch building is that you your desk looks like a uh, white styrene tornado hit it when you're done. Uh, and for, let's get this turned around this way here. Here we go. Because I want you to kind of be able to see both here while I discuss it. So it looks like a complex shape, and I'll show it to you closely in a sec, but um, really what it boils down to is uh, these are rectangular styrene rods. You can see the split line in between the two pieces there. And then all I did was cut and shape and add styrene to it to give it the shape that it is now. So the same techniques that you would use for something like this can help you create something like that. And all I did was round off the edges with a sanding stick. It still needs some work, it's not finalized yet. Neither is the video, so ta-da! Um, sand off the edges with a sanding stick 
and make something like that. So I think that what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, we're all ready to up our scratch building game and we're going to in a project coming up very soon. Um, I got motivated and inspired while working on this to go, you know what? Let's do something even more complex. If you made this by following along, fantastic. It also does work extremely well for that. Um, and it certainly has unity between the designs. And you could keep it as something else if you wanted to, but that was something I made there. Um, didn't take me too, too long to do. And then just uh, use it in situ. And what I like about this is that it's kind of got the same mass as the Gatling gun itself. Um, there's similarities in design. You can actually turn the pod either way and both ways look fine for being forward. Um, but yeah, I just like that. That's a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that all finished up. And then we have the sticker problem. And here's what we're going to talk about with the sticker problem is that I have some toxic Cobra stickers and some regular Cobra stickers for this. I might put some little data stencils on or whatnot. I'm not sure yet. But bottom line up front is I want something here, here, and on the wing. And what I'm bouncing back and forth between is toxic Cobra here, regular Cobra here, toxic Cobra on the wings. This one will be small um, because the fire bat has the display spaces that I love so much. Um, what I have to be careful with is the toxic Cobra symbol introduces two more colors, red and yellow. So if that keeps it odd, that's cool. And what that technically opens me up to doing is using a red symbol here. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because this is so dark blue, it's very much like a rattler. I wanted to take toxic Cobra and bring it kind of closer to the fold of the normal Cobra colors. Um, I wanted the fuselage dark for this to make the wings and the uh, tails pop, which it does, uh, and to highlight the uh, green ordinance underneath, which it also does. It's exactly the way I pictured it was going to be dark blue or a, a purple of that value as well, or a black. Um, so what I wanted to do was have Cobra emblems on here and the Toxic Cobra thing to show that Toxic Cobra was like a subunit of Cobra, not a replacement for um, and it fills up those spaces nicely. It'll busy it up rather nicely and show that with the Toxic Cobra colors, it can still look super cool. And, you know, we've done it with the His Tank and you saw the short on the snake armor. If you haven't, go check it out. Um, so Toxic Cobra can be super fun and I'm having way more fun than I should be with this. But uh, it is a bit of a labor of love working with fluorescent colors. Um, so with the scratch building, all that to say is that we're going to be upping our game a bit. Um... We're going to go beyond basic shapes now because if you've tried uh, since we did the water moccasin together and you've tried these other kinds of things here and you followed along with this project, I think you can start to see how you can take styrene and turn it into things you never thought possible before. Uh, and that's the whole point. So um, let me get some stickers on this thing here. And I'm thinking Black Emblem there, Toxic Cobra there. And I've been thinking about this for two or three days because it's that much of a... Of a a concern when you're doing a project is when you're playing with the colors and then you put the stickers on where do you want where because you know for all you know is if you don't like it you have to pull it off you damage the paint you got to fix the custom okay so i realized that rather than just showing you this thing all stickered up there's a trick i have to employ um with these stickers and i did it with my sludge armor but you might not have seen that uh if you haven't go check it out it's a short it won't take long but anyway it doesn't matter because I'm going to show it to you again here and I'm going to introduce a new tool. I try to keep this to a minimum, but this thing is super useful and I love it. So the toxic Cobra emblems here, they're actually translucent. So that yellow is, well, just the yellow is, the yellow is very weak. The red and the black in the background is fine, but the yellow is super weak. So I found that out the hard way when I was making my acid wolf in that by the time I put it on, the fluorescent orange was so fragile and stuff that I couldn't remove the sticker without damaging the paint underneath. And by that point, I was just done with it. So anyway, now what I do is I undertone or undercoat. No, undertone would be the best thing. Anyways, I put white paint in a circle the same size as the Cobra Emblem. I did that on the snake armor, but we're going to do it a little bit more efficiently with this. So this is white decal paper. Um, it's used for making water slide decals, like your own water slide decals for models and stuff. Um, and it's white. So normally when a decal slides off, uh, as an example, let's say that this marking here is a decal. Then just around the outside of it, it would have this little edging of clear film called carrier film. So when you dipped it in water, it would slide off and that carrier film would be just slightly around the outside of it. So anyway, it's normally clear with a graphic on it. Um, 
it's a little bit harder, at least in my experience, to do with homemade decals. But this stuff is white, so when you put colors on it, they will be more opaque. The problem is you have to cut exactly around the graphic. So, white decal paper has its uses. You can get it at your local hobby store, probably at Michael's and stetc like that too, depending on where you live, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, this thing is called a compass cutter, and it's got a ruler in it. Um, you, I don't know if you can make with the hash marks. Yeah, there you go. So it's got hash marks there for it, an adjustable uh, center point, and then a scribing blade on the outside edge there. Um, so what I did is I measured the uh, distance from the center of the sticker to the outside edge, not the outside edge of the color, but of the sticker itself, right? There'll, there'll be a black background left on this backing paper when I pull the sticker off. Uh, so what I'm going to do, or what I've done, is I started to cut out circles to uh, put on the model or the custom before I put the Toxic Cobra stickers on. So um, it's really simple. You just put, <laughs> place it on center there, I'm trying to be as efficient, well, not a, as efficient as possible. I'm trying to get this to give me good circles as quickly as possible. And all you have to do is lean into it a little bit. It doesn't take any pressure at all, really. And there you go. And the reason why this is a good thing is if you wanted to make circles of different sizes and cut them out of masking tape, positive or negative mask, right, then you can do it. So there's the two big circles done there. And what I find with using the white decal paper is that you can hand paint it, but then you're introducing the thickness of the paint underneath, potentially, uh, especially if it's white on a dark color, which this will be. Um, if you airbrush it and something goes wrong, then you got to go back and repair all that paint, etc., etc., etc. So cutting out some stickers or some decal paper and putting in water for a few seconds, anyways, I'll show you the process, um, is a much better alternative. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this medium one here. I have multiples of these sheets. So these two are going to go on the sides of the fire bat of the fuselage, and then these are going to go on the tops of the wings. I've already got my Cobra emblems on the uh, tail fins already, and I went with black, and I think you'll like it when you see it. So all I have to do here is loosen up the locking nut here. And there's definitely a probably a more accurate way to do this, but this is fast and it works just as well. So the center point of that, sticker there. Yeah, I like that. The trick with these tools when they're so fine and you're doing such small work is to tighten it without moving it. So now I'm just going to confirm that I'm still at the diameter I need. Go a little bit smaller. I think it did move a bit there. And the problem is, is that the same, you'll get this, the reverse issue is that if the white circle is too big, then the, the is, uh, oh my goodness. If the white sticker is bigger than the sticker you're putting on, then you'll have to paint around that as well. Not a huge deal, but one more step that you don't really want to have to worry about. Yeah, that's better. Okay, now I need two of these. So let's do something like this. I didn't go. I was holding it poorly. But it's quite quite a good tool. It's very smooth. Highly recommend it. You get it on Amazon. This is like you can get it on Amazon. This was about 18, 20 bucks Canadian, I think. Definitely worth it. Um, I build models on the side, so um, this will definitely be a tool I'll be using throughout. So, one more of these. I'm going to cut this one anyways. You don't need to watch me do it again. Look, circles. Um, so I'm going to get that done, and then I'll show you how it works if you've never done decals before, and we'll apply the Toxic Cobra symbols together. Okay, here we are, and we are going to do the decaling together. So all you need is the subject you're going to put the decal on, a cup of water. Try not to make it cold. Don't make it hot either. Just 
you know, lukewarm, warm, whatever lukewarm means. I mean, when I hear lukewarm, I picture some dude lying in a tauntaun, but whatever. Um, and all you're going to do is you're going to drop that in there for a few seconds. If you've never worked with decals before, um, essentially they're water activated, most of them. And once you leave them in the water for a few seconds, then they'll slide off the backing. So you would hold the decal near where you want it and slide the backing away from underneath it. Um, roughly speaking, other people do other methods. You could go in the rabbit hole about just doing decals on their own. Anyways, the other thing you want to do is you want to uh, moisten the ends of the Q-tip. This decal paper is very fine. It's very thin. It'll fold back in on itself. So you want to handle it as minimally as possible. Um, you don't need to get too wrapped around the axle about it, but... Uh, don't be surprised if you have to make more circles because um, the decal gets ruined. You want everything to be wet or moistened by the water so that it doesn't stick to you or anything else. And if it does, you might be able to salvage it and get it back. So now I'm just going to do a little test. I'm just going to do this with my fingers to see if the decal is going to move off. It's starting to, but not yet. So we'll just plop it back in the water there. I can feel the adhesive on my fingers here. It's uh, going to feel slightly, uh, not sticky per se, but there's definitely a film there. So now we wait. I'll try it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this stuff can be really finicky. Um, if it takes you a few tries, don't, uh, don't beat yourself up about it. That's normal absolutely normal and this is already doing what I'm telling you that it would do okay so we're gonna have to move relatively quickly here Whew. I haven't used this stuff in a while so I forgot just how finicky it can be um, so what I did is when I did that with my fingers to see if the deck was ready, I let it slide off a bit. It was already starting to fold underneath. But what I did is I created a little space for my tweezers to grab. And then all I did is I kind of wiped the deck up the model to unfold it. And then I slid it off the backing paper. So now with that, I'm going to take a moist cotton butt. And I'm just going to roll it along from the center to the outside of the deck. And that's just going to get rid of all the air bubbles, if there are any. It might move the deck a little bit, and that's okay. It's still wet, so it's still workable, so to speak. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to position this where I want it. And I'm going to landmark that off the front. Well, I'll show you where it is in a sec once I get it in there. There we go. Okay, so the bottom of this circle is in line with the bottom of the canopy. And the forward edge of this circle is in line with the forward edge of the clip uh, on the fuselage there. So that's my, that's my landmarking for that. And it's nicely centered there. Now we're going to do the same thing for the wing. Same process again. And I will, just in case you, if you're trying this and you get frustrated, don't worry. I This is the second take of this scene so far and I've already ruined one of the big circles. It got so floppy and then it stuck to my fingers because the way I grabbed it was all janky. So um, I have to cut another one really quickly. Not a big deal. It happens. Um, are regular decals for models this finicky? Sometimes they can be, yeah. Um, but it's not to worry about, not to worry about. And what I, like I said, what I like about better about this is once you get used to handling the decal paper, um, it saves you a lot of time from, and potentially masking and remasking or whatever with your airbrush, or if you're, you're brushing by hand, if you could paint a decent enough circle that it, the rest of the sticker will hide it, go for it. That's what I did on the sludge armor. Um, this is just another tool in your toolbox, right? And we'll check on the readiness of the decal paper. Nope, not yet. And that's all there is to it. So this next set, this next circle will be for this next smaller one here. These ones are nice too. Um, and in some of the versions of stickers I was going to do, I was going to use those instead and save these big ones for something else, but I don't need to save them. And I really like um, the display areas available on the fire bat. And just to give you a Quick view there if you didn't notice it before. There's the black cobra symbol which matches the interior because I left that black or I made that black, excuse me, and the uh, landing gear here. And I wanted the cobra symbol on there because like I said, the toxic cobra with the colors and everything goes really far from the baseline cobra stuff. So this is my way of trying to kind of bring it back just a little bit to center um, and make it look cooler on the shelf. 
So, oh yeah, we're good there. Ooh. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's stuck to the side of the, there we go. Just move gingerly and gently when you do this stuff. I'm going to re-moisten my fingers. There we go, because it was just stuck on my dry finger, which gave me... Oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Okay. Ooh. So right now, I caught it weird. There we go. It was sticking to my dry thumb. So now I'm just moistening all my fingers here. Get some down on the wing. This is my first time deckling on camera. This is the slow part, but worth it. Totally worth it. Now what I have to do is fix that decal. So what you can do, it's called flooding. Uh, I'm putting a bunch of water on there, just tapping it with my finger. And I'm dragging the decal away from the fold so that it uh, gets rid of it. And there we go. So now I just want to position the decal. And it might refold, and that's fine. <laughs> I hope I'm selling this as a much easier way of doing this. <laughs> I'm just picking my landmark. There we go. There it is. So in this case, for the landmarking, all I did was put the edge of this, the right edge of the circle in line with this, uh, I don't want to point with my finger here, with this panel line here, okay? And then all I did was cut the vertical surface in half. So that's the landmark for that. Now, because that takes as long as it does, you don't need to sit there and watch me do that two more times. I'm going to get that on and wait for the decals to dry and we'll get the stickers on. May I present the finished Vapor Bat. So we've used some old skills and we started introducing enhancements to new skills. We've tinted a canopy before, but we got this one nice and green. We took the colors of Toxic Cobra, in this case, the fluorescent magenta and the fluorescent green, and we tried to knock it back a bit by introducing a more traditional Cobra blue um, onto the fuselage. And what it does is it mutes and tones down these fluorescent colors. And actually, because of the nature of each color, they work well together. And I really love the way this turned out. For the Toxic Cobra symbols, we needed to find a way to uh, make sure they stayed as bright as they should be. In that case, we employed some white decal paper underneath. You can do the same thing with paint if you keep it nice and clean. And that way those stickers now shine on not only the dark blue surface, but also on the fluorescent magenta surface. They keep their original colors. Underneath, we've done some really enterprising things here by using raw materials and found objects to create a whole new loadout for this uh, vapor bat. And it's a good skill to have. We've gone from making simple shapes like the tanks to something a little bit more complex like a convincing Gatling gun to this ammo pod here. And uh, as you can see, with the change throughout the project, you're going to find that is that once you realize how easy the simple shapes are, you're automatically going to want to go into something a little bit more complex. And we're going to go through that even more so on an upcoming project, which hopefully will blow your mind as much as it's blowing mine right now. Um, with that, there wasn't too much on the direction of how I made these parts. That's in a separate episode because quite honestly, it was going to get too long. Um, and I don't mind long episodes. I just don't want to drag things out and bore the heck out of you. So that's going to be a separate episode and you will see how I did these in detail. And of course, we will be delving further into that in another branch of our video tutorials here at Talking Hands Customs. So I'm very pleased with the way this turned out. And I know Toxic Cobra is not everybody's bag, but I think that by showing you the muted version of Toxic Cobra, you can see how much fun it really can be. Um, in the meantime, I hope all of your projects are going very well. To all my subscribers, thanks again for sticking around. If you're new to the channel, Maybe give us a like and subscribe, hit that notification bell, button, thing, whatever that lets you know that I'm about to do something else that's really insane. Either way, I hope everybody's doing fantastically well. Until next time, at Talking Hands Customs, be safe and have fun.